Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is John Hirsch. I'm the Program Director for Democracy for the Arab World Now, and I'm also a visiting scholar at the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies at the Watson Institute here at uh, Brown University. Um, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Rebecca Hamilton, who is an Associate Professor of Law at American University, uh, Washington College of Law in Washington, D.C., um, where she teaches criminal law, national security law, and international international law. Um, she is an international, internationally recognized expert on atrocity prevention and her scholarship focuses on the structural factors underlying international crimes, including the role of new technologies. Um, her work draws on her experience uh, in the prosecution of genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity, as well as her work in conflict zones and as a foreign correspondent. Um, I think we'll leave it at that and just go ahead and jump right in. Um, Rebecca, welcome so much. Um, before we discuss your legal career and your research, I wanted to ask you to share a little bit about your background. Um, you're originally from Etora, New Zealand, um, and you earned your undergraduate degree in psychology from the University of Sydney in Australia. And you're also a self-described proud first-generation high school and college graduate. And I just wanted to ask you how you went from a first generation high school graduate to then graduating from honors um, at Sydney. Thank you um, first for, for having me here and, and hosting this, this conversation. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that whole thing still feels kind of surreal to me actually, because there's a huge gulf between what I imagined for myself and, and what I get to do today. Um, so what's the, the short version of this story? I think it's, you know, childhood was a bit complicated. Um, and my mom is this incredible survivor um, who managed to survive things that, that human beings weren't really designed to survive. Um, but uh, one of the first times that, that she nearly died, I was nine and, and shortly after that, my dad died. And so from sort of 10, I had a sense that I was going to need to um, kind of take care of, of myself. Um, and so while I didn't hate school or anything, it just seemed irrelevant to the basic task at hand. Um, so that was all in, in Aotearoa. And, and by 15, I had left school and, and left home and, and moved to Australia. Um, and I was working, you know, as a teenager, minimum wage, wage jobs um, in an area that was right beside the University of Sydney campus. And I would see uh, these students, college students, and I, and I remember thinking, like, what are you doing? Why aren't you working? What is it? I just, it didn't compute. That, that whole thing didn't make sense to me. Um, and I looked at them with sort of disdain almost, like just seriously, what are you doing <laughs> with your time? Um, but, you know, later on, I got um, taken in from a domestic violence refuge by uh, a woman who would become my foster mom. And, and she was adamant that, higher education was for me. And I, and I fought against her so hard um, because I just could not see it, but she was an incredibly persistent human being. Uh, and so I ended up getting into this program that sort of taught you, well, here's how you write an essay. It needs an introduction and a body and a conclusion. And if you're writing a paragraph, it needs a topic sentence. And here's how you go to the library and find a book, right? And, and if you got through that, then you were given provisional entrance to the University of Sydney. Um, and so I got that and, and off I went. And socially, it was a total disaster. I think I made <laughs> two friends in the entirety of college and, and both of them, I think not coincidentally, were from uh, families that had come to Australia as refugees. Mm. Um, but academically, I turned out to be the world's biggest nerd, um, just off the charts. And, and so I was set up to be doing a PhD in, in neuroscience. Um, but it, it, was, it was comical because I would be doing these really quite um, sophisticated statistical regressions as part of my research. And then I'd be hitting up my foster brother for like, take me through your 10th grade math book so I can fill in the gaps of the stuff that I just still don't understand. Um, anyway, that's, 
that was not a, it's hard to tell that short story in a short way, but, but that's my best effort at it. But I think there's, there's sort of two broader lessons. One that I take from it is one is just the power of individuals to make a concrete difference in people's lives. Mm-hmm. Um, had it not been for that advocacy by my foster mom, then I just would never have um, had more than a 10th grade education. And it's also about the transformative power of education. And that's why it's such a delight to be able to, to teach today. That's incredible. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, the, the persistence of a of mom and uh, a teenager who knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, so from Sydney, you know, you went on to Harvard Law School and the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, what was your path from, you know, thinking that maybe you're going to be a, you know, PhD in neuroscience um, of all things to, to then moving on to study law. What made you wanted to make that, that decision and that change? Mm. So that really starts with 9-11 and more particularly with the Australian government, um, the Howard government's decision to, to turn the fear that that people were feeling into this weapon against asylum seekers. So in the build up to the 2001 election in Australia, um, which happened just after 9-11, there was this vitriol against asylum seekers. And to get to Australian shores is a really difficult journey. You have to cross a lot of ocean and it's traumatizing. And um, nonetheless, the people that arrived on Australian shores were put immediately into detention. Um, including children Mm. and and so there was this um, advocacy group that that put on on the bulletin board um, looking for you know graduate students I think in in clinical site probably but I saw the notice they were asking for volunteers to go and work with these kids in detention centers at the weekends Mm -hmm. and so I started doing that, I was also starting to work at a, at a brain research lab at the time, but I was doing this on the weekends. The kids were amazing. The conditions were horrific. Um, and one the Sunday, I just came back from that. I was like, it doesn't actually matter what we're doing one-on-one with these kids because it's not fundamentally changing the situation. Yeah. Something has to change at the policy level. And, and everything else that we're doing is just fiddling around the edges until the policy gets changed. Um, and it was that moment of then going to work in a, in a brain research lab the next morning was like, what am I doing? <laughs> what am I doing? Um, and, and this sounds painfully naive, but it, it's kind of the story of, of my life in some ways. I, I had no idea how you would get the Australian government to change its policy on this. And I, and I typed into Google, um, what degree to make public policy, literally. Um, and Masters of Public Policy came up. Um, the Kennedy School at Harvard came up. It was the only one on the list that I had, I had heard of Harvard. That might have been the extent of my knowledge of, of universities in general. And I thought, okay, maybe that's what I need to do. And, and sent off my application. And the miracle of the whole thing was that I got a scholarship to go. And so that made that decision. Um, and then, but that was, that was to work on public policy. Um, so you didn't realize this is going to be <laughs> such a long-winded answer. No, it's incredible. Um, that, that was to work on public policy. And then I did first week, first semester at the Kennedy School, I had Michael Ignatieff teaching a course on human rights. Oh, wow. And I went, wow, this human rights thing, which I didn't know existed as a field because I'd been playing catch up on so many fronts. Um, it was immediately clear to me that this was my thing this was this was what I needed to do in life so went back to my dorm room same you know type into google (laughs) what are these people who get to work in human rights started reading through their bios they all have this thing called a jd what is a jd I have no clue um so I'm, I'm looking at oh it's a u.s law degree shit maybe this is what I actually need to get how am I going to get that 
uh, figure out there's this thing called an LSAT you have to set, got the books out of the library, sat that a couple of weeks later and, and amazingly um, got into law school. So, so that is how all that happened. There's a lot of just luck in that process. Um, that's, that's also incredible. Um, thank you. So I, I then wonder like, as a first generation um, high school and college graduate, who obviously was, you know, putting the plane together while I was flying, as people like to say, um, you know, what challenges did you face attending law school, you know, particularly, you know, um, in a US, you know, university that you never, you know, really even heard much of, and, you know, law school is already an intense and often stressful experience. So what were those challenges like? And looking back now, you know, what can law schools and especially like, you know, the really elite law schools like a Harvard, um, what can they do to ensure in a, a more diverse student body, including um, first generation students like yourself? Yeah, there's so much work to be done. I mean, and, and it starts, I think, at the um, classroom and, and level with, with just saying you belong here. Right? Yeah. Um, you know, I tell my, my faculty have, have heard this story because it's sort of seared into my brain. Um, but, you know, starting college where I was feeling like such a huge imposter, um, kind of halfway into sociology 101 in, in the first semester. And the lecturer is up there and, and is talking about sort of abject poverty, subjective poverty. Um, and sets up this, this hypo for the class to engage with uh, that is about a homeless person. And his prompt to enter into this hypo is, well, of course, we can't know what it's like to be homeless, but then open up the question. And, and in that moment, it was the use of, of we. Um, okay, so the professor and every other student in the class is part of a we to which I do not belong. And I, I just felt like sinking through the floor. And, and so the language that we use in classrooms and the assumptions that we make about the lived experiences of people in our classrooms do so much work. Um, and then it's about thinking really holistically from even before students are in law school. Think about who you're staffing your admissions committee with. Mm -hmm. Are they people who know how to read an application from a first gen perspective? When they see a resume that is full of minimum wage jobs instead of internships that are relevant to law school, don't read it as saying the student is not really committed and engaged um, in, in the goal of going to law school. Then, you know, once you've admitted a student, how are you going to? orient them um, even before the first day of law school so that the playing field is, is level or at least some way towards level. Um, and then financial support is, yeah. is a huge piece of this. And, and if you are not doing loan forgiveness for uh, first-gen students going into public interest work, then you are systematically excluding first-generation students from public interest lawyering because they have no safe food net. Right? There is no financial safety net and normally first-gen students are in fact the financial safety net for, for their family and community. So there's a lot, there's a lot of work. <laughs> there certainly is. Um, so after graduating law school, you worked as a uh, special assistant to the prosecutor at the International Criminal Court between 2007 and 2009. Um, I'm old enough to still remember that time well. Um, what was it like to work at the ICC during this really interesting time when, you know, there's real excitement for the court and there's a real energy that international law can be used as this instrument for good. And then at the same time, there's this like real pessimism after the, you know, the unlawful US invasion of Iraq and the subsequent human rights violations and high profile violations of international law. So just what was it like to be there, you know, kind of that really interesting pivotal time? Um, yeah, it was a, it was a fascinating time. And I, and I think what maybe was harder to see uh, from the outside is just what an embryonic institution mm. um, the ICC was at that point. I mean, we were still drafting the staff manual. Um, the human right, you know, human resources department was being staffed up. IT figuring out how to do this across, you know, investigations and languages 
all of that basic institution building work was having to happen at the same time as the court had this enormous mandate um, to, to take on accountability for, for the gravest crimes in the world, literally. Um, and so <laughs> you had an institution that was staffed with people that were highly idealistic um, and, and really committed to this project of seeing this sort of evolution in, in um, international criminal justice. Um, that meant that you also had a whole lot of people who were getting really burnt out yeah. um, and, and were in a little bit of a, a bubble in the sense of there was just so much work to be done um, that, you know, I think it, it became quite insular in that sense. Uh, and the US, of course, had been adamantly opposed to the court. You had John Bolton wanting to kill the court. And so there was a sort of badge of, of almost honor that, that this court was nonetheless operating. Um, so it was like, well, okay, maybe the US is not gonna buy into it, but let's see if we can show that we can do the work anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, it must have been an incredible time, just um, in amazing, inspirational, and then also just overwhelming with the amount of, of things that, that had to be done. Um, and I know, you know, you worked on some of the original ICC cases, uh, Lubanga, Katanga, Bemba. Um, you know, well, the court was also, I think, starting its investigation into Darfur. Um, and, you know, all these years later, like Lubanga and Katanga were convicted and, you know, they've since been released after serving, I think, 15 and 14 year prison sentences, respectively. Um, Bemba's conviction was um, somewhat shockingly <laughs> overturned. Um, and of course, um, Sudan President Omar al-Bashir um, never stood trial before the court, um, which I guess- Not yet. Never say never, right? But, um, you know, that is certainly, a complicated situation with, um, you know, reopening an investigation in Sudanese court and, and everything with that and the, you know, the political um, context right there. But I just, you know, I wondered, like, what did you think of the court's initial years looking back now and these early cases and how they, you know, helped or hindered um, atrocity uh, prevention efforts to end impunity? Mm. Um, it's not a small question. <laughs> No. <laughs> it's 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 a mixed bag it's a really mixed bag because on the one hand you know to what i was saying about it being an embryonic institution the court just needed to show that it could function as a court that it mm -hmm. could actually put on trials that it could be a real court um, because that was not a given um, before it was actually doing it that it could move from an ideal to actually being operational um, and so the, the, the early cases were useful in that sense as, as almost kind of proof of concept. Um, but the other thing that was clear is that the court is just a mirror of the power dynamics that exist within the world. Um, it's sort of a truism that the court doesn't have its own police force. Um, mm. So it's relying on state authority um, to actually enforce anything. And, and I, you know, the court is not outside the structural racism that is baked into our international order. Um, and so while I think, you know, the early cases that the court selected, they all had a strong legal basis for being there. It's not that any of them shouldn't have been there. Um, but at the same time, it's true that there were other cases um, that were equally strong legally that weren't being pursued. And that differential was a product of what strong states were willing to support. Um, so, you know, I think it, it, is, it is a stain on the court's development that it ended up with an initial slate of all African defendants. And the argument on the court side is, well, that also means it was all African victims and survivors, and, and that's also true. Um, but, you know, you need to, you need to challenge um, the structural racism at some point. And, and, you know, maybe Ukraine is going to be a pathway to doing that, in fact. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, you could certainly hope. Um, so you left the ICC 
um, to work as a reporter and a foreign correspondent where you covered Sudan, it's including as a special correspondent for the Washington Post where you reported from the country. Um, I believe during the time that South Sudan um, voted for and gang, it seceded and gained its independence, which um, you know must have been an incredible moment. A new state is not something that um, you know one is privy to very often in their life. Um, so, what inspired this unusual career move, and what was it like shifting from you know uh, working at the ICC to then finding yourself covering human rights violations and atrocities um, in East Africa? You know, it didn't it didn't feel that unusual <laughs> unusual a move to me um, because it was still sort of part of the same um, set of concerns. It was just a different way of of approaching it. Um, so I had been feeling increasingly distant from the communities that that the court was sort of working on justice on behalf of. Right? I wasn't. I was in the prosecutor's office, so I wasn't part of, of an investigative team. Mm -hmm. I wasn't on the ground speaking to people. Um, so I was. I was missing that. Um, and then, you know, I was so fortunate that it was really the Pulitzer Center that, that knew I could write in non-legalese and, and the Washington Post that then took a chance on me. Um, but I saw that as, as actually completely consistent with, with everything that I'd been doing before. And, and as you say, I was, I was there for the secession of South Sudan, which was an extraordinary, extraordinary moment um, to witness in history, notwithstanding the devastation uh, that has since followed. Yeah, um, it certainly could have gone better since then. Um, but um, that's really interesting. The, the skill of writing in non legalese, I think, is something that could serve all lawyers well. Um, so, and, and speaking of which, um, during that time, you published your book, Fighting for Darfur, you know, which examined grassroots advocacy efforts um, to push. Um, especially U.S. political leaders and policymakers to respond to this crisis and to, to stop the genocide in Darfur. Um, how did this experience inform your thoughts on the role of advocacy and strengthening human rights and atrocity prevention? So the whole project was really just this very earnest effort to, to try to understand the impact of all the advocacy efforts that had happened around the Save Darfur movement. Um, and you know, it was a really sobering process, in fact. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I had hoped to write sort of the heroic sequel to the theory that, that Samantha Power laid out and the problem from hell that if you just had sort of US citizens rallying and calling Congress, then um, that would move the needle and we would do better on atrocity prevention. And, um, you know, she, she couldn't have known how it would go because it hadn't happened before. Um, and, I, and I still don't know whether, you know, had that happened in the midst of the Rwandan genocide, there really would have been a different outcome or whether that's a story that we like to tell ourselves because we're never going to know the counterfactual. But it was worth trying. Um, uh, the trouble was when we tried it, um, the international order was, was already shifting. Um, from the situation that, that she had been describing in that immediate post-Cold War period. And the US was just not the country with the most leverage everywhere and certainly not in Sudan. And so while US-based citizen advocacy could do a lot to get Darfur, which is not traditionally part of you know, the foreign um, policy of the US government's attention, um, it could get it on the agenda. And, and that was amazing. But then the question is, well, what after that, right? Because getting attention is, is just your first step, but it's in the necessary but not sufficient category. Um, and US citizens couldn't reach the Chinese government, for example, yeah. the Chinese government didn't care. Um, and then the other thing, so, so that, that was a limitation. And then the other thing that was sort of even more depressing that it took some time to see is that to build a mass citizen movement of volunteers, people who are working full-time jobs, looking after families, doing their thing, um, you're not paying them. And so to get them to keep doing the volunteering, to go to the rallies, to attend the protests, to send the postcard, 
you've got to give them something. They have to feel like there is a purpose for what they're doing. You have to be able to say you're making a difference uh, because that's the reason why they're doing it. And initially it was making a difference because it was moving Darfur up to the top of the pile or, or closer to the top of the pile of a crowded foreign policy agenda. Um, but over time, the limits of the fact that, that the US didn't have as much leverage as people had anticipated, and even when it did, it was butting up against hard US national yeah. security interests and, and counterterrorism interests, so we, we can't take out that piece of this either. Um, it was hard to honestly tell people that they were making a difference. And, and so the advocacy movement had to generate what I call sort of quick wins, like you know, victory, the email goes out to however many thousands of volunteers, you know, we sent this number of, of letters to a congressman's office today. But we, you know, we can't show how that, that becomes an end goal in itself, instead of focusing on how does that translate yeah. to um, the people again, in whose name this is being done on behalf of. And I think, you know, what that left me with was a sense that has played out in, in absolute bucket loads in Sudan, that unless you have the people um, who are directly affected at the heart and center of your movement, then it's, it's not gonna work um, in the end because people get tired and they go back to their lives. Sudanese can't do that. They don't have that luxury. No. And, and that's why we've seen it was the Sudanese people who ultimately overthrew Omar al-Bashir. Yeah, I'm, there's so much to that. I think, um, you know, you raise a great point about like, um, and, you know, full disclosure, like uh, I worked uh, for the Enough Project, which very much, you know, came from the Save Darfur movement um, in a very specific way. Um, and, you know, just lived and breathed all things Sudan for several years. And um, it's one thing to get things on the agenda, and that's a huge accomplishment. But to be able to keep them there is like another thing altogether. And I think, you know, we always said, like, you know, at the Enough Project, like, we're trying to prevent genocide and crimes against humanity. Like, we don't really have anyone who is pro these things in any real sense. But on the other hand, like, you still have your this adversary, which is like, you know, just, um, like you said, people move on, you know, there is always just this, like, you know, apathy, I guess, maybe for lack of a better word of just, or fatigue, where things aren't getting better, and you're working so much, and you're doing all these things, and it just does, you know, start to feel, um, you know, pretty bleak, but I, I do think those are um, really good insights, and I would, um, I still think it's a, you know, it's a fascinating book, it's a it's an account of like a really particularly interesting kind of foreign policy and, um, you know, civil activism moment in the United States. So I would, you know, highly recommend for people who haven't read it. Um, I think it holds up really well. I was looking at it the other day. And it's like, yeah, a lot of this stuff still very much mm -hmm. resonates. Um, so from there, what made you want to pursue a career in legal academia? Um, you know, and how did these, these previous experiences of practicing international lawyer um, as a foreign correspondent or reporter, how do you think that prepared you or shaped you, you know, that transition for you? Um, and then I guess also, you know, kind of connected to that, like, what do you expect to, you know, what do you want to accomplish through your scholarship and through your teaching? Hmm. Um. So again, this could be just a reflection that I'm, I'm skeptical that any one sort of profession or approach um, is sufficient on its own to deal with hard problems. And, and so I kind of see myself as, as keeping on jumping into different places to, to try to tackle the same problems. Um, but in this case, there were a couple of pieces that came together. One was sort of back to a first gen issue. Um, when I was doing the book tour, it gave me the opportunity to get into a lot of college classrooms. Mm -hmm. um, and I had absolutely never seen myself as a law professor. I would have found that completely laughable. <laughs> um, but I was in these classrooms doing things that were kind of like lectures and loving it, loving the conversations with the students and sort of started thinking, well, why not? Like maybe this isn't impossible for someone like me to do this. Um, and, and, and then sort of more pragmatically, all the lights have just gone off. Um, more pragmatically, let's see if I can stand up. Yep, there we go. There we go. Um, 
more pragmatically, I, the last time that I'd been in, in what we were still then calling sort of the North, like Sudan proper before the separation itself, um, I had been detained, was taken to one of the ghost houses, um, was fine, you know, this is not a tale of woe um, because I was a white Western woman and, and so it was fine. But, but what it meant was I was blacklisted and couldn't get back um, again. And so that was, you know, for a while I was just reporting from other places, but it just felt frustrating to, to not be able to get back to where I wanted to be. Um, and uh, my wonderful husband and I thought it would be a really nice idea to raise a family not in a war zone. <laughs> so uh, we, we were also thinking of, you know, ways that, that we could move. Um, and, and the pace of a new cycle is, is really demanding. Yeah. Um, and one of my frustrations over time is that you're always reporting on what has just happened. You're never able to get ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted, I thought, and, and this is borne out, I thought academia would, would give me the space to think more holistically and in a more forward-looking way um, about still all of the same issues. I've, I've been a you know, one-track atrocity prevention person. Um, so this wasn't any different, but it was just a different way of approaching it. Yeah, um, it could, that makes um, complete sense. Um, so, you, you know, I know your recent scholarship, you're really focused on the role that technology can have in atrocity prevention, such as um, user generated and new media evidence and international criminal trials. Um, and could you just explain those concepts and how you think they could advance human rights and atrocity prevention? Yeah, so, you know, back to having time to think forward <laughs> rather than just reporting backwards. Um, that was what, you know, I initially did this, this user generated evidence piece like five years ago and and at the time um i had some feedback that this was sort of a bit of a niche issue that might not, might not go anywhere um, and then you know the idea that that cell phone users are documenting more crimes in real time is so prevalent and we're watching it we watched it in syria we're watching it unfold in in ukraine um, so you know, I'm, I'm glad to have had the time to start thinking about this um, earlier on. And it's a real mixed blessing because on the one hand, you know, thinking back to um, at the prosecutor's office with the Sudan case, um, you know, this, the Sudanese government wouldn't let our investigative team right. in the country. And, and so all of that work was being done um, from the camps in, in Chad and among the diaspora <laughs> Um, and so there's, there's not only kind of degradation of evidence over time, there's actual room for destruction of evidence directly by perpetrators when investigators can't get to the crime scene, the conflict zone. And um, user-generated evidence, the idea that, that people who are have living through atrocities in real time can do some of that documentation and preserve some of that evidence um, is an incredible gift for accountability. Um, but it also comes with real risks and chief among them are the security risks for yeah. the people that are doing this. Um, and it's, it's sort of terrifying <laughs> to me, that part of it. Um, and then the other thing, and, and we'll see how this plays out with Ukraine, because I, I wrote recently, it's, it's sort of going to be a real test case for the ICC in this respect, but there are some things that are more amenable to being filmed on a cell phone than others, right? You mm -hmm. can um, film the bomb that is exploding, um, the, the impact on people who have, you know, the dead bodies, the people who have been injured, the things that are happening in a, in a visible public space. Um, but there's two problems with that. One is, that's not necessarily what an investigative team needs. So we talk about the difference between crime-based evidence and linkage evidence. The crime base is so clearly there in, let's take Ukraine, for example. Um, but the role of an international criminal lawyer is, is to be able to connect that crime base to holding an individual accountable. And there you need linkage evidence. And that's not necessarily what people who are in the midst of atrocity are filming. The second and, and sort of more pernicious issue is that there's 
a selectivity bias that goes on um, while while everyone's got their cell phones out uh, in the sort of public square you're not getting documentation of the torture or the rape that is happening in a detention facility and so it skews the record of available digital evidence that you have um, and and so that's really on on the lawyers the investigative teams to be conscious that what they're able to get digitally is not necessarily and probably unlikely to be representative of um, the criminality in, in the conflict itself. Yeah, um, I think uh, your, you know, your point about just, you know, people get old, people pass away, um, you know, and, and, and it's just the preservation of evidence is such a challenge. And I think like in another context, that's why I had such great hope or, still have great hope for the the triple im and just like thought like you know we saw this in sudan where there just was no political will to you know really move a bashir to the icc and while the time you know evidence is getting less and less reliable and you know i think that there is some sort of overlap where at least we have this evidence now and you know not all of it will survive you know in court but a lot of it will and I think that, you know, at least there is hope there then that there is a political moment where there is real will to, you know, hold these people accountable. And now you actually have the evidence to go with it. So um, I guess in that sense, I'm hopeful. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, less, so. yeah, yeah, no, I, look, I, I agree. And it is better to be in a position of having the evidence and not having it. Yeah. I do think, though, there's a risk of us leaning too heavily on feeling good about just having done the evidence collection. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, without thinking through, well, to what end? And I, I'm a little bit worried that we're setting up survivor communities for an expectation of justice that is not going to be realised. Um, and there's also kind of, on a, in a more technical sense, a problem of over collection of evidence and then how you filter that into different accountability me mechanisms whether it's domestic prosecutions or international pro prosecutions um, but i think you know we're learning and and these these processes will get better and more specific and more tailored over time yeah uh, that is a great point about expectation though of uh, of um, you know the communities that are most affected and, and keeping that in line with what's what's really possible um, so for technology more specifically, you have a forthcoming article called Platform Enabled Crimes. You know, what is that about and what are you hoping to achieve with that article? So uh, this is in some ways the flip side. I, you know, I, I put out user-generated evidence and, and while I was quite, you know, keen to highlight the risks, it was also a sort of positive story about technology, right? You, people are, you're getting- That rarest of things. Right, the, the positive, you know, the power, empowered to, to do the documentation. Um, but I was, of course, still connected to all my journalist friends around the world um, and, and talked to them about these issues to, to get out of the kind of law bubble. Um, and the stories were, but yeah, Beck, you know, this this tech is is actually devastating um, a bunch of communities that we're working in and and that was and continues to be true um, and so i thought okay well i'm i'm gonna <laughs> i'm gonna need to write something about this um, and there's a case study in there that is about what happened when facebook now meta um, entered the market in in myanmar um, and it is a horrible story of a platform being manipulated by the military leadership um, to help them in their campaign to incite genocide against the Rohingya population. And the, there's nothing at this point, unfortunately, um, new about that situation, um, but the response had been and, and still to a degree is, well, you know, if you're talking genocide, you need to think about the International Criminal Court, but the International Criminal Court doesn't have jurisdiction over corporations. And anyway, the really bad actors here are the Tapmador and their allies that are responsible for the genocide. And then the other side of it is, well, there's this business and human rights um, community that that is trying to get some corporate accountability in these spaces and get corporate actors to do a better job 
Um, but in the tech space, at least, they're really focused on um, privacy and freedom of expression, mm -hmm. um, which is, is a particular concern uh, in US academic circles. Um, it's not necessarily the priority when you're being subjected to genocide, right? There are, there are other concerns that are higher up on that list. Um, but I feel like business and human rights isn't, hasn't got its head around that yet. And, and so what I'm trying to do with this piece is to really push us beyond thinking, well, those are the only options. Um, and to say, just because accountability is hard here, just because it doesn't look like the existing systems that we have, um, what might we nonetheless be able to do? And, and also to try to get um, the agency of, of survivors to be in the lead in that conversation rather than just a bunch of lawyers saying well here are the mechanisms that we have available and and yeah. we'll see which one fits yeah um that's really interesting um i also think it's you know maybe you want to speak to this but like the you know the u.s version of freedom of speech is you know not the same version of freedom of speech that's shared around the world which i think is a really fascinating thing even you know when you uh, when you go to law school and you kind of figure this out, like, um, I wonder, you know, if that has any impact on, on how you're kind of looking at this. Yeah, it's been um, incredibly frustrating to me just how US centric um, that yeah. conversation is. And it's, and it's because the major social media companies that we're talking about that have global reach outside China and Russia, um, they're US companies and, and they're working on a US conception of, of First Amendment rights. And that is fine if you're only serving communities in the US. Um, well, it's not fine for some of them, I should say, but, but yeah. you know, um, but it's, we shouldn't assume that that, um, that is a global, global model or a global norm. Mm -hmm. So uh, moving on to the international law um, question and, you know, really the story that everyone in the world is talking about right now. <sighs> Russia's unlawful invasion of Ukraine. You know, this is a, you know, clearly an unlawful aggressive act that requires, you know, among other things, a strong legal response. And you recently published a model of indictment of the crime of aggression against Ukraine on just security. Um, could you explain what a model indictment is and how it might be used in this case? And just, you know, the general challenges to um, prosecuting aggression at the ICC, which has its own, you know, kind of specific, um aspects to, to deal with yeah so so let me start by by backing up a little bit mm -hmm. um which is to to lay out the fact that the icc has jurisdiction over war crimes that are being committed in ukraine and that is great and it's pursuing that um, the need for the model indictment it comes from the fact that the icc does not have jurisdiction in this case over the crime of aggression so war crimes are the things, as you know, that are happening in the conflict. Um, the crime of aggression is the decision to resort to war in the first place. Mm -hmm. And that was what, you know, if you go back to the Nuremberg judgment, they described this as the supreme international crime. Um, the longest surviving prosecutor from, from Nuremberg, Ben Friends, will, will always tell you um, that it is that resort to war that leads to everything else that follows, right? Mm -hmm. War is devastating for civilians. It's always devastating for civilians. Um, so rather than, again, sort of fiddling around the edges of do war better, just, just stop the resort um, to force in the first place. Um, so the idea behind the model indictment, and, and this was um, Ryan Goodman, a professor at, at NYU who co-founded the Just Security Law blog, we were talking about, um, just what would this look like and, and making it real for people and in particular for lawyers um, that this crime that we haven't prosecuted since Nuremberg, um, here we have a situation where the facts could not be more clear. Yeah. Uh, and, and to actually write that out and to show people um, in, in really concrete terms how the facts and the law match here the only thing that is missing is a forum through which to prosecute this crime. Uh, and so, you know, we wrote the indictment as, as I would have written an indictment at, at the ICC. Um, and you go through the elements of the crimes and they're laid out. We use the ones that, that 
are in the Rome Statute, which is one of the most narrow definitions of aggression under international law, um, and, and showed how even on the basis of, of purely public reporting, um, there's, it, it, the indictment kind of wrote itself, but the facts are there to match the law. And, and so now the question is, well, what does the world do about that? Yeah, uh, I think you raise a great point. I think um, the jurisdictional part, you know, is glossed over all the time, uh, even, you know, in reporting analysis today. And, you know, it is just fundamental to, to accountability. Um, and it is just, you're right, like, you know, the facts just could not be clear. And uh, it is really interesting after, you know, the last 20 years when really focusing a lot on non-international armed conflicts. And all of a sudden here we have a, you know, honest to God, state to state, um, you know, international armed conflict. Um, so, you know, past violations of international law never justify current violations. But one of the more um, contested debates surrounding the Russian invasion of Ukraine is the extent to which, you know, Russian go Western governments made um, President Putin's decision a little more palatable. Um, you know, by weakening international legal norms, which is something that's been written about a lot, um, you know, the last several years, but even longer, really. Um, but especially, the, you know, the last two decades, um, we've touched on, you know, the U.S.-led invasion of, of Iraq, and I think the U.S. government's willingness to continually stretch the meaning of uh, the use of self-defense. Um, do you find that argument persuasive that, you know, these actions have, you know, weakened international norms in a way that, you know, well, certainly did not justify this act, but, you know, made it a little easier for, you know, a self-interested actor like President Putin, you know, to initiate, you know, this, this aggression. I'm not, I'm not convinced that Putin needed any um, sort of uh, groundwork to be laid for him on this. But, but what I do think that that, that critique is getting to is something more, more fundamental. And, and I think it's worth maybe addressing directly, which is just the selectivity Yes. In what we're willing to call out um, and you know this is something that that I've been having to think a lot about in you know in putting together this this model and diamond and and saying that we should be going after Putin for aggression and and the obvious retort to that is okay so where was the indictment for the invasion of Iraq um, and that is a real concern um, it's also not a concern I can do anything about in this moment, um, but to sit with the discomfort of that. And the two situations are, are not the same, um, but, I, but I understand the critique. Um, on the other hand, and, and you can see how conflicted I am as I try to work through this, but um, it, I think, history keeps showing us that we need to seize these moments for um, progression in international law. And, and there are these moments, and, and right now is one of them, where there is real interest and political will in holding accountable someone who is the head of a permanent five member of the UN Security Council. Yeah. And this is not going after some leader who is in part of the global south that is very weak and has no power on the global stage, no economic power, right? This is going after um, someone who is at the very center of the way um, this global system is constructed. Um, and I want to see that opportunity seized because I think that it, and I, and I think this is also why um, I'm not sure it'll happen. Um, it will set a precedent, mm -hmm. um, and and once you set that, then it's it's harder to walk back from it. Not to say that powerful states won't try. Um, power is always fighting back. Yep. Um, but yeah, that's that's sort of fundamentally, I think, where where the situation is at. Yeah, I mean, certainly there will be a precedent one way or the other, you know, whether it's towards accountability or, you know, towards not. So, um, yeah, I've never felt, you know, personally more uncertain of where something is headed, um, you know, regarding the P5. I think it's just could be an incredible moment. It, it could be, you know, just um, totally disheartening. It could be somewhere in between, but it is fascinating. Um, 
So then, you know, one other question, you know, the prospects for holding President Putin and other Russian leaders accountable for aggression or war crimes. Um, you know, as you mentioned, the ICC recently launched an investigation in Ukraine for war crimes. What are the other possibilities, you know, for holding uh, these, you know, Putin and these other leaders um, accountable for aggression or other opportunities for, for prosecution, maybe outside of the ICC that have, you know, been discussed? Yeah. So, you know, we should all be clear, we're not going to see Putin in the dock anywhere anytime soon. Um, it's going to rely on him traveling outside of Russia and he's plenty smart enough to know not to do that. Uh, I think it is it is a really different story for uh, those that are under him. Uh, and what has been interesting just in this past week, so, you know, on the one hand, there's talk about some hybrid, um, maybe Ukraine um, Council of Europe Tribunal, maybe General Assembly Ukraine Tribunal, maybe Nuremberg-esque special tribunal. Um, all, all of that, those possibilities being explored to get at the things that the ICC can't get at at the international level. But also you are seeing domestic prosecutors in Europe um, yes. really moving forward. And, and this, you know, we always say, and, and it's true, that, that the International Criminal Court was established as a court of last resort. Mm -hmm. um, and the dream for the ICC would be to have no cases because uh, domestic states are, are holding people accountable that should be held accountable. Um, this, this moment where we're seeing those movements, and, and so that's really encouraging to me. Um, you know, at the same time as being depressing because we, we don't see the same movement on Sudan. Um, I, you know, I use that because it's, it's the community that I'm, I'm most connected to, but, but, you know, likewise Syria and, and so on. So, um, but, I, but I think the, the answer is it's not going to happen for Putin anytime soon. I think it will happen for people um, lower than him in particular. It's sort of striking the number of commanders that are on the ground in Ukraine. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they should be concerned um, about accountability. And the only thing on, on Putin I might end with is that no one thought Milosevic would ever be in the dock. Right. No one thought that Bashir would ever be overthrown. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's worth taking a longer um, time horizon. Yeah, I know that's not comfort now, but I do think that's always important to keep in mind. Um, I also wonder, like, if you think, you know, will we see more courts, uh, more foreign courts exercise universal jurisdiction over some of these cases, like we've seen with some of the um, German cases of, um, you know, of uh, Syrians who were, you know, implicated in, in some pretty terrible crimes that were committed during that conflict? Yeah, so, so universal jurisdiction um, is, is one thing that we're going to see. Um, and it, so my, um, my colleague, Professor Diane Orlicker, had a piece out today um, also pointing out that in a lot of these cases, you don't even have to rely on, on universal jurisdiction because Ukraine, which has jurisdiction on many grounds, um, is really keen to see other countries take this up and, and will delegate its jurisdiction. Um, so I think there are, there are a number of, of options and it's going to be good to see those moving ahead. Yeah, oh, that's, that's a great point about um, delegating jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so um, I do not want to take up all the questions, although I certainly could. Um, so I'm going to go to a couple that we've got from um, some from the students. So um, bear with me, everyone, as I try to, um, you know, professionally read these off, off the chat here. So, okay, the first question, um, thank you for the conversation. I know in an ideal world, we would continue to generate grassroots advocacy until our, our government effectively addresses human rights violations or prevents them. Uh, technology is partly to blame for the shortening news cycle and catalyzed genocides, but I'm wondering if I can provide examples, or if they can, I'm sorry, provide examples of how it is um, empowered victims and help the, uh, their indiv individual futures, not just affect policy. Um, and that question, thank you, Sonita, that was very good. So any thoughts on a very uh, fraught question there? Yeah, hi, Sunita. Um, so, you know, around the world, there are, there are 
tons of great examples of of how tech is benefiting communities and you know just the most sort of straightforward is the ability to do um banking on on a cell phone right the, so the ability in in communities that might have difficulty accessing national identification documents for example um, to be setting up small and community-owned businesses um, with the technology that's available. So there's there's a ton of pluses from tech in general, um, but you know it's it's like in anything there are there are costs and and benefits of of all of this. Um, you know there is the benefit of our ability to reach across physical kind of you know geographically constrained boundaries to get to know um, communities in different places but I my personal view I'm, I'm, I'm working this through as I'm, I'm talking it is is that at least the major social media companies right now um, notwithstanding the fact that they uh, which is their most major US social media companies, notwithstanding the fact that they they tout that benefit, right? Everyone can be connected, the world can be connected. Um, their business model is is not designed around making that happen. Um, the business model is is designed around keeping us all tied to our phones um, with ever more extreme material that that supports um, our own sort of pre-existing biases and and that is not a way to foster new connections across communities um, so it's not that the technology couldn't do it I think it it is not designed to do it right now um, but there are people um, Ethan Zuckerman would would be an example who are working on ways that you might design this tech differently from the ground up well, you know, that made me think, I wondered, um, you know, if, if you had any thoughts about, you know, the connectivity and particularly banking, um, you know, if you had strong thoughts about the efficacy of the sanctions as they're used, um, as they're being used now against, um, you know, Russia and Ukraine, and perhaps, you know, as they're being used other places as well, where, you know, there's maybe less of a, um, you know, consensus about whether it's a good idea or not, particularly in, you um, not the Ukraine's not suffering right now, but you know, in, in other countries, you know, particularly in the global south, that are you know less developed, um, more fragile. And I just wonder if you, you know, if you've connected to that in your research on on tech and atrocity prevention. So I think this is, you know, part of the sanctions conversation. More generally, is that we're getting better at doing sanctions. Yeah. Right? The, the move towards smart and targeted sanctions has been really helpful because I think in the early days of sanction as, as a lever um, against uh, uh, governments committing atrocities, it, it went against the entire state. And, and mm -hmm. again, Sudanese have suffered greatly because of this. Um, but I think the US government is, is getting better at doing that in a targeted way. And I think there's increasing recognition that those blunt widespread sanctions are not actually helpful. And, and when you do it that way, it's the people who are most vulnerable who are least able to work around them and, mm -hmm. and the elites that are able to, to get around them. Yeah, I mean, certainly I'm sure you saw that firsthand um, in Sudan. Yeah. And I think, you know, we all know um, Madeleine Albright passed away yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and I think like, you know, one of them, you know, stains on her otherwise incredible, you know, record is, you know, really supporting these blunt instrument sanctions in Iraq um, that really did real damage in that country there, um, you know, which is, no one has a perfect record, particularly with that many years of service. But I think like, you know, you make a great point about how we are getting better at this and um, they are much less the blunt instrument they used to be and now a more, you know, specific um, targeting device. Um, so another, another question, um, it seems one of the differences between the US invasion of Iraq and the Russian invasion of Ukraine is that Iraq was not a party to the ICC, but Ukraine has accepted its jurisdiction with regards to Russia. Can you talk about that precedent for a state that is not party to the Rome statute, accepting the ICC's jurisdiction 
and whether that could be an avenue for prosecution of Russian generals and commanders captured in the war, if not Putin himself. Yeah, so there's, oh, <laughs> my, my office really doesn't like me sitting down. Okay. Um, it's actually kind of a great thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so neither Ukraine nor Russia are parties to the ICC, nor is the US, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but the ICC has a provision where it can say to the court, we're going to grant you jurisdiction over our territory without, without having fully signed up to the court. And so that's what Ukraine has done. It's perfectly um, foreseen and legally appropriate under the statute. The challenge, and, and this comes back to your question about, you know, the way that the US uses international law is noticed by other states. The US position on this is that nationals who are not a state party to the ICC, so US nationals, um, the ICC cannot exercise jurisdiction over them, even if they commit crimes in a territory that has given the ICC jurisdiction. Russia is now going to use exactly that same <laughs> argument to say we as Russia are not a party to the ICC. Therefore, even though you have jurisdiction over Ukrainian territory, you cannot get jurisdiction over Russian nationals committing crimes in that territory. Um, this position um, that is the position of both the US and Russia is not widely supported uh, among other states, is not widely supported as a matter of international law. Uh, and I think it needs to change. And, and it's going to be interesting to see, though, how the US government threads that needle um, and whether it's able to, to walk itself back from that position that it has taken. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think um, you raise a great point there about, um, and, and this has been brought up a lot in the, in the last couple of weeks about, you know, um, even while people are, are uh, criticizing the ability of international law to to do things sometimes fairly sometimes not um, we're still speaking in international law rhetoric we're still having these arguments through an international legal framework lots of times and um, you know it does bring up the point of be careful of the argument that you made to justify your own actions because other states that maybe don't have as good of intentions as you do will make those same um, arguments. And then you're really at a difficult spot because you're arguing against your own argument at this sense. And, um, you know, um, I don't know, I, I wonder, are there, are there other examples you could think of that, um, you know, you think will come back to hurt, not just the United States, I guess, but other, you know, Western or democratic um, countries that have really kind of put forward hard arguments um, in international law that are, you know, could be, you know, co-opted, I guess, by, you know, authoritarian or, you know, an actor like a President Putin. Yeah, I mean, so anytime there is um, use of Security Council um, veto power, there, mm -hmm. there's an, an inherent concern there. Uh, you talked earlier about this sort of um, expansive turn to using the justification of self-defense. Although I think that's been, I think that was at its extreme during the Bush administration and, and has been walked back in some senses um, from that. Where we've seen it expand again, though, is regarding self-defense of particular units in the field. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's another area of risk. Um, the doctrine of the responsibility to protect is another one that is ripe for manipulation. And I think it's so cynical what um, the argument that, that Putin has made about needing to go um, into Eastern Ukraine um, because of, of what he claims is a genocide there. And I'm, I'm really thrilled um, to see the Ukrainian case brought before the International Court of Justice. Um, to really just say this is <laughs> this is not okay to invoke the genocide convention um, in order to to justify a war of aggression, it, um, but it's it's interesting that it's playing out in in international war terms. Yeah, um, 
that really is breathtaking and it's cynicism um, that you would use that. Well, maybe um, you could spend just a minute then um, explaining like the difference between like what's going on at the ICJ versus, you know, what's going on in the ICC and how that differs yeah. in, and who's going to be held to account potentially. Yeah. So kind of International Courts 101, the, the International Court of Justice gets to adjudicate disputes between states, um, not individuals, can't hold individuals criminally responsible. Um, the International Criminal Court can hold individuals criminally responsible. So they get different types of cases legally, um, but sometimes, and we're going to see this in this, this situation, we also saw it in um, the Bosnian context, um, there it's the same underlying conflict that, mm -hmm. that they're taking different pieces of. So what's happening at the ICJ right now is that Ukraine bought a claim against the Russian state um, under the Genocide Convention, which both Ukraine and Russia are party to. Um, and the court said, yes, we've got jurisdiction. Um, and with that, what the court can do before it gets to the merits of the case, um, which is really about whether there was, you know, genocide and, and this cynical move by Russia, um, it can issue something that it calls provisional measures, mm -hmm. uh, which basically makes sure that there's not irreparable harm in a situation before the court has the chance to adjudicate on it. And that's what it did last week. My days are running into each other. Uh, yeah, um, it was last week. And, and said that Russia <laughs> needed to stop um, its acts of aggression immediately, uh, which of course Russia ignored. And so then everyone said, well, what is the point of ICJ anyway? What is the point of international law anyway? But um, it is, I think, again, get, getting back to what's the timeline that you're looking on. Sure, it would be lovely if we're in a world where the ICJ would say, Russia, you need to remove your troops. And so Russia removed its troops. That's not the world we're in, but it doesn't mean that the ICJ's decision to do that is meaningless. Mm -hmm. It becomes another block that, that we can add to the broader political efforts um, to stop the war. Um, so what, what that means now, though, is that the case will progress to the merits and there'll be briefings and, and this will all take some time, um, but eventually there'll be a decision on that. Meanwhile, at the International Criminal Court, which has jurisdiction over war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, does have jurisdiction against aggression in certain instances, long and complicated story, but, but states basically have to agree. That's not the situation in, that we're in with Ukraine and Russia, which is why we need another court. Um, but as we discussed, uh, Ukraine has given the court jurisdiction over war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide happening on its territory. So the ICC is already moving forward. Um, they had had this jurisdiction for some time, 2013, I think, uh, maybe 2015, um, to look at what had happened with the annexation of Crimea um, and other things that were happening in Eastern Ukraine. Um, and now they're just really moving forward quickly to the next stage of the investigation um, and looking at Ukraine as a whole. Yeah. Um, so, you know, another, we mentioned like the doctrine of, um, of, of self-defense, um, you know, um, and R2P, how that can, you know, is, is kind of set up for abuse by, um, you know, bad actors, you know, another um, international legal um, doctrine that, um, you know, never seems to quite go away is this idea of humanitarian intervention, which, um, you know, as far as I know, I think the only two states that really have a, a legal position supporting this would be the United Kingdom and maybe Belgium. Um, you know, otherwise, I think it's, you know, clearly not accepted by, by um, other states that this is, but this is a, you know, a lawful idea. Um, I also think it's been interesting to see this term conflated um, as to what we, what, um, you know, government should do now when it's, when really, um, you know, under the doctrine of intervention by invitation, there's nothing stopping Western governments from, you know, militarily intervening on behalf of Ukraine in a lawful way. There's just obvious real policy and military escalation risks that's stopping this. Um, I wondered, you know, if you thought about that and, you know, if you had any thoughts about, um, you know, humanitarian intervention 
um, you know, I, I do think it's interesting. It always kind of comes back to what we talked about earlier and Rwanda. And there is always this counterfactual that's put forward of like, well, if we had just done that, we could have saved all these people. And I mean, um, you know, as someone who's spent um, significant time in East Africa and worked in some of these countries, I'm, it's a hugely morally persuasive position, but then you also wonder like, you're arguing a counterfactual and it might've worked, it might not have, it might've been totally worse, which is hard to imagine, but I guess not impossible. So any thoughts on, on you know, kind of the, the return of this to at least, um, you know, legal discussion, if not like serious state discussion? Mm. Well, I mean, Libya today is our, mm. is our complicating um, case on, on that, right? Because I think there was a real sense um, in the Obama administration that this was a, a good example of whether you call it a, you know humanitarian intervention or, or responsibility to protect um, it it could have been it was it was looking in some ways like a kind of Rwanda moment when you had the language that that Gaddafi was putting out um, and the very genuine um, threats to civilian lives um, and so there was the intervention that happened but then the question is well for the Libyan people is that a better outcome when you look at the situation today um, so it's always a question of what comes next and you don't you know there's no there's no easy solutions in in any of this because you don't want the fear of what could come next um, to paralyze actions that should be taken um, but I think you know yeah. The, the, the very few case studies that we have where actions have been taken um, aren't necessarily comforting. On the other hand, the plenty more situations where we have where action hasn't been taken are equally distressing, right? Yeah. Um, so it just goes to, to sort of the reality that these are hard problems. Um, but I think it, it's useful to just be clear on, um, as you foreshadowed, the difference between something that has been done as a humanitarian humanitarian intervention, usually uh, we've seen this take place without the genuine consent um, of whoever is formally in leadership in that country. That's very different from Ukraine saying, please come, we need help. And under international law, we'd say that is part of um, a collective self-defense claim that every state has, has the right to and is, and is perfectly legal. Yeah. Um, so I'll ask you one more U Ukraine question. And, um, you know, we've seen recently um, some back and forth between the U.S. and the Chinese government about, um, you know, providing military support to Russia during this time. And um, I think we've seen a lot of <laughs> opinions, um, some good, some not as good about what this means legally. Um, you know, would you want to explain, like, you know, what this would and wouldn't do between, um, you know, U.S. and Chinese relations and, you know, what that would mean for China's uh, participation um, in the conflict um, in, in terms of international law. Yeah. So helping Ukraine is a very different story from helping Russia in this con <laughs> context. The two things are not equivalent. Um, Ukraine has a legitimate claim to self-defense here, which is why I can ask other states for help. Um, Russia does not. Um, so, you know, this is what's what's strange about this is so many cases that that you and I have studied are there are some shades of grey uh, that are really not so present in this scenario. This was um, an act of invasion by Putin, um, and so any support of him doing that of Russia's actions. Um, can't be characterized as helping another country that is operating in self-defense. Uh, and it means that, that you become culpable um, to that wrongful act. Similarly, I should say, um, and I think we, we might do a superseding indictment at, at some point of the role that Belarus has played in oh, yeah. um, allowing Russia to, to launch these attacks from its territory. Um, that also puts Belarus on the wrong side of, of the international war line. So 
maybe one more question about um, tech then. Um, misinformation is such a huge problem. Um, you know, uh, in this conflict and others, I remember in the South Sudan context where um, in kind of the, the, the middle of the last decade where, um, you know, you'd see these pictures on, um, you know, South Sudanese Facebook or South Sudanese um, people using Facebook of, you know, something terrible. And it was to really incite, um, you know, violence against a particular community. And then it'd be like, wait a second, that is a picture from, you know, the genocide in Rwanda or, and, you know, these are very basic, um, you know, kind of, it, you know, it doesn't take an expert to realize, you know, pretty quickly, like, wait, that is not what's happening now. And, you know, please let's not act on this. Um, deep fakes and other things that are getting so good are, I think, really terrifying. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's obviously a way technology could be harnessed in a negative way. So I wonder, you know, if there are, um, you know, law and tech kind of solutions or approaches to kind of combat these things now um, before they really get to the point where, um, you know, you could see some really negative consequences as a result. So, you know, the answer is that, yes, there is a lot of work that is happening in, in the tech community. Um, I guess I'm always a little wary of tech solutions to tech problems in that I think in a lot of cases that we've seen, what really you need is, is community-based solutions with real people in real time um and and the idea that we can kind of have a tech fix um to stuff is is often um inaccurate um, but that's not to you know that's not to be dismissive of the hard work that that engineers um and the like are are doing um to try to reduce the spread of of deep fakes and and the other thing is this is happening at such scale yeah. You you cannot have um, you know the broader issue of content moderation. It can't be humans that are doing all this work. Firstly, it's just a horrible job, and secondly, um, <laughs> even if you could, the scale is just overwhelming. Um, so there there's got to be some um, tech approaches to dealing with that scale, um, but it's only going to be one part of the solution. Yeah. Do the, and do you think that would be like an AI? solution or? yeah so there is already some ai work and and machine learning that is doing the filtering out um of of inauthentic images but um it's one piece of the puzzle yeah okay so we have one more uh student question for you um from elizabeth um and this is <laughs> Concerns about, um, you know, with what we're seeing uh, Russia do in Ukraine, um, her concern is how and if we could stop um, China from doing something very similar in Taiwan. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's the right question to ask. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it speaks to why it matters um, the way that the world responds to this decision by That's a great point. Putin. And and I and I do very firmly call it Putin's decision, right? I think I think he's um, yeah. led this, and so you know when there are critiques of, for example, well you can't get Putin in the dock right now, and you know why are you even trying anyway? They've got a permanent seat on the Security Council, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it is exactly for for these reasons that you need to do the work regardless because it sends a signal to other leaders out there um, about whether the international community is just gonna let it slide um, when there is use of force in, in violation of the UN Charter. Um, so I think it's, it's a great justification um, for, for pursuing the international law position in, Absolutely. in this case. Um, so I do not see any more questions in the chat. I feel like I've asked you a thousand questions. <laughs> um, so I don't know if you had any any last words or any last remarks, um, things you're working on, things you would you know um, encourage students to read, or if we could just leave it here. <laughs>
Yeah, no, I would just say, you know, thank you for um, a really fun conversation. Uh, I would say to, to any students, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, my email is, is readily available. Um, and it's, you know, if these are issues that are interesting to you, we need as much help <laughs> as we can get. We need generations and generations of students to be working on these tough problems. And, and you've probably seen from the way that I've spoken, I, it doesn't matter what lens you're working on them through. It doesn't matter whether you're gonna tackle this as a lawyer, as a journalist, as a community organizer, um, as an artist, any of these are, are useful to contribute to the broader project of, of doing a better job on, on atrocity prevention than we've done thus far. That is well said. Um, well, thank you so much for your time. I would commend everyone to, um, you know, look at, um, you know, Rebecca's bio on her faculty page um, at American University, Washington College of Law. Also, um, she writes often for Just Security, um, which is a, you know, wonderful kind of national security law, international law um, site. And, um, you know, these are really fascinating um, topics and they're reasonably concise articles. So I think, um, you know, it's a great way where you can read those. You don't have to have a law degree to understand, um, you know, it helps sometimes, but for the most part, you know, it's just, it's a really interesting, um, you know, forum to, to look for these things. So Rebecca, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, thanks again. All right. Take thank you care. everyone. Bye.